Well, hello, everyone. It is uh, 12 o'clock Eastern time here uh, in the United States. And I want to welcome all of you from around the world who are tuning in for this event. Uh, we had well over 150 RSVPs for this event from uh, all over the world, different continents, different countries. Uh, and we have a global panel of speakers here as well to wrestle with this or begin to wrestle with this question about AI, chat GPT, and its effects on history. Uh, my name is Jason Steinhauer. I'm the founder of the History Communication Institute. Very briefly, the History Communication Institute is a new organization just formed last year. Uh, we are concerned about the future of history and the future of the humanities, to put it bluntly. Uh, we feel that there are many headwinds facing professional history and the humanities more broadly, technological headwinds, societal headwinds, political headwinds. And we've resolved to bring a community together to try to tackle these headwinds head on and chart a future, not just for history communication, but for all history education and humanities education. Uh, we have a community uh, that is formed around these questions around technology, for example. Uh, we put out a report a couple months ago about TikTok, its potential effects on history education and history communication. We're now taking on this question of chat GPT and AI. And if you wanna be part of that community, the good news is you already are by joining this event and being with us today. And if you wanna deepen your involvement with our community, I encourage you to join our Slack. We have a Slack dedicated to these questions with 90 people from around the world. And throughout the chat, we'll be putting links in the chat that give you more information about how to join us and be part of that community. And there will be a link to join our Slack group uh, in the chat momentarily. Uh, we are thrilled to co-sponsor this event tonight or today, depending on where you are, uh, with the International Federation for Public History Explorers and the wonderful Dr. Jimena Perry, who has just very graciously uh, helped us along the way every step with this. So I want to turn it over to her uh, for a couple of minutes just to introduce herself, the IFPH Explorers, and offer a welcome. Okay, thank you, Jason, very much. As Jason mentioned, my name is Jimena Perry. I am part of the International Federation for Public History. I am the project manager of the Explorers. Explorers is a international like space devoted to promote public history, but not only public history, but like the public in history as well. Um, and we are very interested uh, about the event is happening today. I think it fits perfectly with all the interests of the Federation and the Explorers. And we also want to thank Jason for, for making the Federation part of this important conversation. We cannot uh, be, um, I mean, we, we, we need to be part of it. And also the Explorers is thrilled to be part of this. And we are thrilled also to be part of the network as well. So we hope we you enjoy the event today and welcome very much. And if you want to learn more about the IFPH Explorers, they have Facebook, they have Twitter, and we'll put links in the chat as well. Uh, to learn more about them. We have uh, a little bit of housekeeping to do just to talk about the runoff show and the program, and then we're going to get right into it. Um, we are going to have a, like I said, a global panel of speakers. We have speakers from all across the US, Canada, and Europe. Um, and uh, we have some who have had deep expertise in this question and have been uh, working on it for quite some time. We have others who are new to this question and are experimenting and want to share with you some of the insights that they've learned in that experimentation. This very much is a round table. We don't pretend to have all the answers today, but we think it's important that we start asking some questions and we do that in this forum. If you have questions during the event, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end, but we're also gonna have an open Q&A at the end. It is gonna be a very much an active round table. Uh, and so there will be an opportunity to raise hands and ask questions at the end. And so you can either hold your question to the end or put it in the chat as the panelists are speaking. Uh, at the end, also, we're going to do a call for next steps. Where do we go next with this conversation? Should there be some more research? Should there be a report? Should there be some more collaboration with tech and AI companies around these questions? These are all on the table for the History Communications Institute and other organizations to tackle. Um, Finally, I'm just going to uh, just quickly reinforce the rules of the History Communication Institute. We operate on a strictly no hate speech, no discrimination policy. I don't think that would be an issue with this group, but it just bears worth mentioning. Please act with kindness and with decorum. 
uh, in the chat and in your comments. And if for some reason that gets breached, we will remove you from the event. Um, and I think with that, that is all uh, I need to cover in terms of housekeeping. So I'm going to turn it over to Johanna, who, first of all, is graciously hosting us on her Zoom today for this event. Uh, but secondly, Johanna was actually the impetus for this. The way the History Communication Institute works is we build this community, and then we solicit ideas from within the community about issues that we need to be thinking about and wrestling with. And Johanna brought this idea to our Slack group uh, about five or six weeks ago and said, we need to think about this. We need to convene a conversation about it. And so we did. So she's going to lead us in starting this conversation and she's going to join us as a moderator once we get through all of the speakers. So let me turn it over to Johanna for the first word and to set the stage. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I hope that I'll be the least knowledgeable on this call because I'm really searching for a lot of answers myself. And so when I put out that you know open call on Slack saying that this, this needs to be discussed, um, I hope that you know there's some other people out there thinking about these things and might be able to provide some some framework. Um, so I'm a public historian in Orange County government in New York State in the Hudson Valley. And in New York State, we have a longstanding state law, which was passed in 1919, that requires that each municipal level of government appoint a historian. So it's a very unique law that we have in the state. But as really the original unfunded mandate, uh, we, we have a very uneven level of support. So some communities support the historians and others you know, uh, don't provide many resources for them, uh, but you know, have to have them on uh, as an appointed official. Um, but to add to that, history departments, along with perhaps planning departments, are among the few departments not thinking in terms of budget cycles and election cycles, but thinking much more long term. Our projects are uh, planned well in advance of important anniversaries and larger institutional goals. But um, this ever increasing immediacy that we see in our society and this emphasis on STEM that's taken place over the past decades um, has been very problematic for us um, and it, it matters because our budgets depend on, on the level of support that we're getting from elected officials and, and other government officials. So for this reason, I have a lot of anxiety about the near future of the profession. And um, I have a lot of anxieties about AI coming into the workplace, not necessarily because it's going to affect our work so much as it is going to affect the expectations that others have on our work. Um, so let me start by saying one of my anxieties is that um, or before I go to anxieties, let me start with some of the positives. So I've, I've been experimenting with chat GPT this past month, and I see great potential for our work. So one of those things is that I have found that the program is very useful for taking a larger piece of original writing or research, and then quickly turning that into something that's more accessible to a general audience. So this might be, um, you know, taking some larger report and turning it into a uh, summary for elected officials or for or for administrators, or it may be taking it and turning it into a newsletter article for the public or um, or a press release or something of that matter. So it's been very useful in taking existing information that is already vetted, that's already researched, that you know is good information and reconfiguring it. And I've also found that it works very well for, mul for drafting multiple versions of a piece of writing. So in, in the case of preservation advocacy, you can take bullet points about the importance of some issue, um, feed it into this into this program, and then you have multiple letters that go out and create a little bit more of a personal feeling. Um, it helps to get the point across, uh, you know, not not just a form letter, but something more personal. This is something that I've always done anyway, uh, manually. So I take a list of bullet points and turn it into several letters to send out to different stakeholders. You know, you have a Republican stakeholder, you might want to turn um, some of those issues into something that's going to fit with their way of thinking. If you have a Democrat stakeholder, you're going to turn it into their way, way of thinking, and you're advocating for the same, you know, general good, but. Um, but you know, tailoring it and personalizing it. Well, I found that you can put that into chat GPT and you can pretty much generate that very quickly. Um, and you don't really lose much of the quality because you're, you're working with sound bites anyway. So those are places where I see it speeds up the work and it's, and it's great, it's very useful for us. But, um, but I also um, am very concerned about some of the ways that it's going to harm the profession. Um, so, one of the ways is that such a small percentage of local history records are digitized at this point, and even a smaller number of the digitized records are accessible to the public. 
Um, so a lot of these records might be digitized, but they're in a computer or you know, in files within the government itself. Uh, we have you know, lots of security issues that, that prevent us from having material that's not uh, behind a paywall or at the very least behind an account wall. Um, so we have that problem of, of sources not reaching you know, these open source databases that AI is pulling from. And then uh, to build upon that, when um, you know, local governments might decide to, they might look at this program and say, well, great, we can invest in a large overhaul of digitizing records. And it you know, eliminates the need to have as many staff members uh, you know, going through paper records. Well, the problem with that is the discernment of records, because as we all know here, a lot of these older records are biased or they're uh, embedded with local myths in the community. And so it really takes an individual with some historiography training to understand what they're seeing. So, uh, you know, just to put it in, in real terms, like does AI have that ability to distinguish? Um, does it get that little feeling that you and I, we know we get when we're looking through a source that isn't right or biased in some way? Um, and, it, you know, for lack of a better word, that sort of bullshit meter of, of this, this information isn't correct. Uh, and then being able to search even further to find the accurate information. And, and I think so far, at least in this early form, um, that isn't there, you know, so I've already experimented with, with asking certain questions and what I'm getting back is that it's not distinguishing between the good and the bad sources or the outdated sources. Uh, it's, it's not able to do that yet. So the big problem that I see, the overall problem here, um, is that an answer satisfies. And so in government, often the wrong answer uh, in this fast paced government environment setting will take precedence over the truth because it's, um, you know, it's an answer that they can run with. And I'm sure you've all heard politicians double down on bad information because they saw it in writing or they saw it on, on a Google search. And so when this bad information is now coming from an AI system that can put out some pretty good writing, some very you know decent readable writing, it's gonna seem authoritative. And I'm afraid that that's, that that's gonna get even, that line is gonna get blurred even more. And I'm afraid the it'll do kind of mentality is what's going to take prevalence. Um, so, you know, maybe some people don't care because in this in that environment, getting an answer out quickly is important. Uh, but it does matter because there's a bottom line that if the wrong information is getting into things like grant applications, it could it could jeopardize funding. Or uh, I'm sure there are many other real life um, possibilities of things where this could go very wrong. Um, so I know I'm coming to the end of the five minutes, and um, I'll save some of the the real life examples for uh, the end when there's questions. But I just want to say one other little thing that's floating around in my brain that I think um, some of you may be able to help me with, um, or maybe it's irrelevant, I'm not sure. But I think back on when cars became commonplace and wheelwrights, uh, you know, didn't lose their jobs immediately, right? They, they, there were a lot of wooden components to cars. It was quite a long time as, as, as their, their skills were still needed during that transition. And then you think of something else like tinsmiths becoming plumbers, or you think of whalers becoming commercial fishermen, or, you know, these transitions that took place in professions around the, the turn of the 19th century. And I keep wondering that, are we, um, are we going to be obsolete because this profession won't be needed in some way? Or, uh, or are we in some sort of a, other kinds of transition where we're going to take on some other role for some you know, in some near future. I mean, those sorts of questions are in my mind. Are there any historical analogies for what's taking place now uh, compared to to what took place a century ago? So I open it up uh, to all of you. Hopefully you can bring some clarity to some of these questions. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Those are great questions. I do, uh, I love the uh, the bullshit meter for AI. I think if someone's probably working on that, I'm sure. Um, but also this question about how much agency do we have and how much agency can we claim as we move through these transitions? I think that's an important question, something that HCI is very concerned with. Um, next, thank you, Johanna. Uh, I wanna turn to um, Sadia and Nathan from Sitara Systems. I met them at South by Southwest last year where they gave a presentation about some of the work that they've done in museums uh, and with technology, emerging tech such as AI, and was uh, really impressed, uh, just found them to be really smart, really brilliant, really forward thinking, um, immediately latched onto them and invited them into the HCI community and exactly for moments like this, so that we can hear from uh, people who are working in the design world, in the tech world, uh, but have connections with museums and the humanities and the arts 
to get their perspective. So I'll throw it over to uh, Sadia first uh, and Nathan uh, as well uh, for them to offer a few thoughts and insights based on what they're seeing and what they're doing. So over to you. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. And thanks for inviting us in. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm Sadia Akasha. I'm the co-founder of Sathara Systems, along with my partner, Nathan, um, who's also on this panel. Um, so a lot of what we do is we're a creative technology and design studio, and we work with cultural institutions to communicate their missions using technology. Um, and we also communicate complex systems and strategies um, that these organizations are using. But what we really try to get the visitors and the audience to kind of grapple with is how they can start taking that information and using it to turn a critical lens um, towards, towards the future. So we're sort of future facing, whereas using the information and, and the uh, data points that we have and sort of queuing people up to think about the future more critically. Um, we've been experimenting with ChatGPT um, during, within our projects and with our teams. Um, much like Johanna said, uh, a lot of what we found really useful about it is um, using it to draft sort of initial draft, the first draft to get over that blank piece of paper that you're staring at. Um, to sort of ask it questions that give you those first few um, you know, prompts and sort of things to start off with. We also use it to refine some of our writing. Um, and this is really useful, honestly, for, uh, for museum work as well, um, in terms of we can sort of ask it questions like, you know, tell us about uh, an introduction to minerals or tell us about minerals and how they might be used um, throughout the Green Revolution. And then we'll ask it to refine the, the, the data that it's giving us and say, can you rephrase that for a ninth grade reading level? Um, can you add more technical details? And we do have content strategists on our staff that we've actually are asking to use ChatGPT, but essentially under their guidance and their expertise. So they're doing their own research. They're using ChatGPT to just get some words on a page um, and start to get towards a cohesive voice. Um, but they're really, going through and doing a lot of the, um, the research to make sure that what the information that's coming out is valid, um, because we have found that ChatGPT will sort of make things up as it will, um, because it's pulling, it's sort of drinking from the fire hose of the internet. It's pulling whatever information is out there and, and uh, it doesn't really discriminate. Um, so we do find that we need subject matter experts to look over the content and really have some familiarity with, um, with the area. So that's, one place that we're looking at using ChatGPT and kind of bringing it into our workflow. Um, the other thing that we've started using it for is um, things like social media, um, just sort of writing blurbs and being able to put together quick, uh, quick sort of content that has a very casual vibe. Um, a lot of times we don't, um, you know, we don't always have time to kind of think of a, a, a cute way of saying, hey, look at this this work that we're doing, um, you know, kind of gets tiring to sort of point to the same social media, to the same uh, items on social media. And so this is a, a very easy way to use ChatGPT to kind of come up with blurbs. It's also really good at generating hashtags, it turns out. Um, so that's been kind of a fun finding. We've been working with our studio manager and kind of seeing how we can use that. Um, and I think the, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that um, in terms of references, uh, we've asked it for references for any of kind of uh, papers that we're writing and it completely makes them up. Um, and when you ask them where are these references coming from, are they made up using our bullshit meter, um, it will then fess up and, and admit that um, they're all made up examples. So it's just so important to figure out, you know, sort of what are the edges uh, of verifiability um, and validity that you're working with in ChatGPT. So that's a, a little bit about um, about how we're using it. I'll hand it over uh, to Nathan if, if you would like to introduce yourself or uh, Jason, if you have um, anything else to say. Nathan, please go ahead. Okay. All right, sounds great. Thank you, Jason. Um, my name is Nathan Lockenmeyer. I'm the other partner of Sitara Systems. Um, and additionally, I'm a computer human interaction researcher. So I studied um, computer science at MIT, including artificial intelligence. And I've been studying how technology affects human behavior for over a decade now. So thinking about how new technologies can kind of um, affect the way that we live and work is, you know, right in the wheelhouse of the things that we think about at Sitara Systems. Um, there was something that Johanna said um, just a few moments ago that really 
um, struck at the heart of some of the things that we think about and talk about, which is, are there historical analogies or comparisons that we can make to how artificial intelligence might kind of affect um, the way that we do things? And the one that immediately comes to mind, actually one of the topics of the South by Southwest talk that uh, Jason saw last year, was that we actually have a huge body of historical analogies, not just with technologies, but actually with animals as a source of intelligent labor and intelligent collaborators that we use to help us get work done. And I always think of how, um, you know, if we look back to even something as simple as agriculture, like the adoption of animal labor in the field of, of agriculture to plow our fields didn't mean that we replaced farmers. It amplified their labor, it changed the way that agriculture was done, it increased the efficiency of it and meant that we could do brand new things that we never could do with agriculture. But fundamentally, the, the animals don't know how to run the farm on their own. So they still need, we still need humans involved to kind of manage the process. And when we've seen technology get added to agriculture, it's much along those same lines of, you know, we have bigger machines that can plow fields faster and can plant seeds automatically. We still need humans involved to kind of have the intentional strategy of, um, you know, what gets done when, like, what is the purpose of what we're doing and what are the critical strategic decisions that need to be made? And I think that that's a trend that's going to continue with um, all of these new artificial intelligence tools. We've been looking a lot at how these new generative AI models, um, including large language models like ChatGPT, but also text to image models like DALI, MidJourney, and Sable Diffusion are going to affect creative industries. And the analogy that we've been really using when talking about it is that they're really good for sketching. They're really good for fast iterative work that's rough, that it's early concept, it's low fidelity, it, you know, we know that it needs revisions and that it needs editing and don't pay too much attention to the specific details, but think high level about how it's kind of helping you communicate what you're trying to communicate. It's um, these kinds of tools, especially ChatGBT, are really great at formulaic writing. We found that they're great at um, methodologies, describing methodologies in papers. They're great at writing scopes of work, of job responsibilities. Um, Congress has started to write house resolutions with them because it turns out house res resolutions have a lot of boilerplate language in them. Um, I've seen consultants and grant proposals written with them, but, and it's great at all those because there's a lot of consistent structure in kind of those styles of writing, but it's really terrible at creative writing. If you ask ChatGPT to write a creative story, it gives you the most basic story arc you could possibly think of in the blandest writing style you can possibly think of. Um, so it's just really important to keep in mind when you're using tools like ChatGPT that at the end of the day, ChatGPT doesn't really have any model of knowledge. Like it doesn't know anything. It doesn't understand the world around it. It's really just a probabilistic model of stringing words together. It knows what words tend to appear next to other words in specific orders. And it's extraordinarily good at that, but it doesn't actually able to think critically about um, about what it's writing, what it's talking about. Um, so I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. I have um, plenty of more examples, plenty of more use cases to talk about, but I don't want to go past my five minutes. So I'll save them for um, our panel discussion that we're going to have in a few moments. So with that, uh, Jason, take it away. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks to both of you. As promised, a diversity of perspectives a true roundtable with a lot to chew on. I've already got a page and a half of notes, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to be joined uh, live from Europe by two scholars at the University of Luxembourg in one of my favorite places in the public history world, um, the uh, Contemporary Center for Digital uh, Humanities and History. Uh, I'm sure I got that name incorrect, so you'll you'll uh, correct me. I always just call it C2DH, um, but it's an amazing place. I got a chance to visit there last year with uh, Thomas Colvan, who I believe is on this call. Uh, so let me turn it over to you both for your expertise and insights. Um, we will start with uh, Frederic Clavert and then go to Lorella Viola. Okay, thanks a lot. I think that you uh, you see my presentation uh, now. Thanks uh, for for the organization of this event. I think it's quite in, important to um, to discuss um, 
to discuss about large language model. Uh, I will just focus on the pedagogical use of ChatGPT and before ChatGPT, GPT-3, which is the engine uh, behind ChatGPT. And it's based on an experience that I have uh, done last semester and that I will redo um and that i will redo the, the the next semester um so basically my first hypothesis is that uh, the problem of chat gpt and other large language models based chatbot uh, it's not about cheating cheating has been the big discussion uh the last few weeks among uh, scholars among teachers uh, i think it's a problem but i don't think it's the main problem the main problem is whether that we tend to believe that those systems are reliable, that they are um, saying the truth. That's the problem. By we, I mean scholars, not only scholars, but everybody, the audience, the, the large, the, the, the public. Uh, and so we, we should do something and get that, again, that idea. So my use case is basically based on the comparison between chat GPT, so the text that are generated by chat GPT and how it works, a comparison with, from, uh, between chat GPT and the historian method. Uh, and this comparison has two aims. Uh, first, uh, emphasizing the pitfalls of large language models, uh, and then showing the specificities of the historian's work, uh, works and method, how, how we work. Um, um, so I will start not with a text, but with an image, because before ChatGPT, we, before we spoke a lot about ChatGPT, uh, we spoke a lot about uh, one of other open AI products uh, that is called DALI2. And DALI2 is basically uh, generating um, images from text. Sorry, yeah. uh, images from text. Um, and um, the, the, the thing with those images is that they're, they're, there's always something wrong. You, you see the hands here, uh, they don't have five fingers. And it's um, easy for our brain to see that those hands have no, not, uh, haven't five fingers. The problem with text is that it's hard to see if they've got five fingers or not. Uh, it's much harder. Um, for instance, you've got here, uh, I asked ChatGPT to, um, to detail a bit the life of Jean Monnet. Jean Monnet is a French high civil servant who played a role, notably in the 50s, uh, for the, the 1950s, for the, the creation of the first European com community. And I created this text, and the aim with the students is to correct this text, to see what's wrong with this text. Uh, which ends up with this, and, and you can see that there are many levels of wrongness, and that there are many things that are in this tech that are problematic, including some false information. Um, so there are different levels um, of, of, of problematic text, uh, and there is something that is striking in this text, it's that it's the vocabulary. The vocabulary is not good. It's not enough, it's not precise enough. It's very Euro-optimistic, Euro uh, and we're not necessarily supposed to be Euro-optimistic as teachers. We're supposed to be not well, we're supposed to be neutral. We're supposed to, uh, to, to teach something larger than, I mean, the European ideal. Um, um, and um, and there are things that you could accept from undergraduate students, but not from postgraduate students, because it's not precise, it's not defined, etc. So that's the first point that you can really um, insist on. It's um, it's how the fact that we when we work, we try to be precise, we try to use the right words at the right place, in the right sentence, in a way. And the second thing that you can uh, insist on, it's the question of the sources that has um, already been um, been mentioned here. Uh, when you ask uh, ChatGPT to, um, to to speak about its sources, it's a debaker. It's not able to point to a precise source. Um, if you try to go deeper, uh, for instance, it will answer that uh, the data it was trained on is, pro um, is based on proprietary data sets that are not public. So you don't know what is the data sets it's relying on you. You don't you don't know the primary sources of ChatGPT basically, um, and in the French version, the um, uh, ChatGPT um, uh, gave me some uh, reading advices. It was basically Wikipedia, uh, the European Commission uh, website, 
but no scholar works. And scholar works on the European integration are like many, 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 but it was not able to give an example of a scholar work that would be interesting for, for the user of chat GPT. Um, so that, that was my main point, in fact, because basically the historians are nothing with the primary or secondary sources. And chat GPT is something because it has no precise sources. Chat GPT is not compatible with our methods. And that's why that's what we should prove to, um, to students. And I'm, uh, I think at the end of my five minutes. So thank you for your attention. Terrific, thank you so much. Lorella, please. Hi, uh, everyone. And uh, I think my, what I'm trying to say, what I'm, I will be saying now, uh, it's a nice bridge actually, um, from what Frederick just said and from what Nathan said just a minute, well, seven minutes ago, probably. Um, so I'm uh, Lorella uh, Viola and I am a linguist at the Center for Contemporary and Digital History at the University of Luxembourg. So Jason, you got it almost right. <laughs> um, okay, so, um i would be talking um about my experience uh, using um gpt uh not really the chat but uh, the uh, open ai tools so the model that can be used um when you use it trained on your own sources so it's a little bit different so that's why um in a way it's a nice complementary discussion of what Frederick just said because yes i used it to investigate primary sources um, so I will give you just a super brief, quick uh, historical background on what these sources are. Um, I'm working on um, digitized historical newspapers uh, written by Italian American immigrants at the turn of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, this already poses so many challenges because, um, as you can imagine, the sources are not uh, digitally born. Uh, but they have been digitized, which means that there are several problems, um, the so things that happened in the digitization process um, that basically created, introduced many errors in the digital copy. So this is already one big problem. And the second big problem is that the language is not English, obviously, because these are Italian American uh, immigrants. So GPT mainly works uh, and has been trained on English. So my question is also, when we talk about large language models, which language do we actually mean? Don't we just mean basically English? What do we do with other languages? But I'll try to give you, let's say, an answer that actually raises more questions uh, at the end of my five minutes. Um, okay, so this collection belongs to that category of sources that have long been neglected and has been like resurrected by digitization. So this already poses yet another problem on top of the already pro uh, already mentioned problems, because obviously this is niche. Uh, not many people have looked into this uh, anyway. And just to add a further layer of complexity, my uh, research topic is also quite niche, <laughs> because I am looking into um, the concept of um, return migration. So not just the transatlantic migration from Europe to America, but also what happened to these migrants once they reached the new world and actually after a while decided to go back to Europe. Um, and um, I think there are perhaps maybe 10 scholars that have looked into that. Uh, so it's been a long neglected um, topic, which means that there is actually not much scholarly work on this. So as you can see, there are different layers of complexity here. So why did I uh, want to use um, GPT on these uh, sources? The reason is because I want to move beyond um, keyword search or n-grams or um, similarity scores and, and all the things that NLP people know very well, that yes, they are useful, but they don't really capture whether there is a discourse uh, in a large text or repository. So I thought that perhaps using GPT and prompting, giving the, the right prompt to GPT could actually answer uh, my question. So what I prompted the collection for was uh, tell me, so something like, um, tell me how, um, migrants uh, uh, talked about um, returning to Italy. Tell me how um, return, return migration was debated in uh, uh, these uh, historical sources, things like this. And I am interested because the, the few works that have been done on the matter um, 
which have never looked into this particular source actually, uh, argue that there is a discrepancy between what migrants actually experienced and what was debated back in the country. So in this case, the nationalistic uh, uh, exaltation of returning migration has been rich and successful rather than uh, miserable and is a failure. So I wanted to see whether this is actually true. So my results, uh, which um, I go full circle to what I just said earlier, so were actually rather disappointing. Um, so I hope you can see uh, my result from the Google Colab that I, can you actually see the Google Colab uh, notebook? Okay, so so I asked a few questions. So just the, the prompt that I just told you, what I basically got was um, just a repetition of the same sentence many times or words that have been patched together, but they don't mean anything in Italian or very little and in any case uh, seem to have nothing to do with my research question anyway. So and I thought I would just show you this because it's much quicker than me just explaining. So um, so my, my question is um, when we say language models used and you know the anxiety is fair and it's fine but can we actually um, have the same anxiety when we use it for languages other than English? And what is the experience of anyone working with GPT tools um, in, in languages that are not uh, English? So I would love to know that. Um, so yeah, that's my five minute contribution. Thank you. Fasc <clears throat> Fascinating, thank you so much. And I just love the diversity of expertises here in terms of in the classroom teaching, scholarly research, public history, museums, in advocacy, engagement work. This is the true diversity of what it means to be a historian on display here and all the ways that chat GPT and these tools might interact with that. So it's really wonderful. And to that point now, let me um, bring in a couple of colleagues and friends who have joined our HCI community who are now experimenting in different ways with these tools in the field in their respective corners of the world. Uh, the first is uh, my friend Steve Manier, who is actually um, the historian in Dublin, California, and also an author, uh, gave me a wonderful tour of Dublin, California when I was out there last year. And uh, he also, uh, unprompted, came to me and said, you know, is, is the HCI doing anything about, about this new tool and these new technologies? Because, um, you know, I'm looking into it and I have some questions. And I said, we are, in fact, doing something and we'd love for you to contribute. So, uh, Steve, let me give you a few minutes here to share some of your observations from the field and some of the questions that uh, have come to you uh, through the uses with these technologies. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Manier. Uh, I am a local historian. I'm, I like the term that was used earlier about niche. You can't get much more niche than my particular area of local history in suburban California. So I'm here in part because of a dinner conversation over Christmas. Uh, the conversation had to do with this thing called chat, chat GPT and how it's the most wonderful thing ever. And you can use it to figure out how to screw in a light bulb uh, among many, many, many other things. So I wondered afterwards, what can I do with history? Or Probably after listening to many of these people today, it's, the question is, what are other people thinking that they can do with history when they go to chat GPT? So I have for the last 20 days uh, queried chat GPT on the question of what is Dublin history? You know, what is the history of Dublin? And I can tell you uh, the wonderful thing is that I have found entirely fictitious people. I can now say with some uh, certainty that John and William Dublin are the basis for the name of our city. Uh, entirely fictitious, fictitious people that I've never heard of. But then again, there's hardly anyone like me looking for the history of Dublin, California, a town of 70,000 people near San Francisco. Um, but what uh, I can say is that if you go for multiple times through chat GBT and ask the same question, you will get different answers at different times. You will also get um, something that I have seen recently, which is they're getting in increasingly generic answers about specific questions, which is just an interesting thing to, to see. Um, in the course of trying to figure out what this means for local historians, I, I came across a really great 
a quote that I'm going to share with you. It's from the London Review of Books. And it is, uh, chat GBT is so good at generating convincing answers. It is easy to forget that it is a model of language and not a source of wisdom. So that made me feel great. I think I had a sense of what this is all about. And I have more of a sense based on what I've heard everybody say. Um, I can walk away knowing that as a local historian, I am not irrelevant. Um, I'm just another lonely voice out there in the, in the winds. But I think it's important for all of us to realize that ChatGBT is going to be a resource that the common person uses to answer history questions. And we need to explain to them that this is all about a tool that was designed for a particular purpose. Uh, to examine language and examine what words go with it. And it doesn't necessarily have much to do with how accurate or reliable. So I, I think one of the th takeaways for me is to go out and tell people, hey, remember um, what tools you're using and is this the right tool for the question you're trying to answer? If uh, all you have is a hammer, every answer requires pounding. But if you have a history question and you use chat GBT, you need to understand you're not necessarily going to get um, something very good out of it at the very minute levels of local history. Realizing that there is much more information used in the database on common things, it's probably much more likely to be reliable on the common well known things than it is on the very specific. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that and just remind everybody garbage in, garbage out. But when I look at chat GBT, I think of treasure in, treasure out. If the information that we have that's important and valuable gets into the database, then other people might be able to take it out. And thank you, phone, for telling me I'm all done. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Great as always. And then our last contribution uh, before we open it up to a conversation among the panelists uh, will be from Paul McGuire, who's joining us from Canada. And Paul has a background in education uh, and is currently at the University of Ottawa and has also some uh, experimentation, and some thoughts uh, on how this can be applied in various settings. So, Paul. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Jason. Uh, I think um, with the time I have, and I'm just looking here, um, I kind of want to react to some of the things I have heard uh, just in in the last uh, half hour or so because um, when I've been doing work, I'm I'm a PhD student uh, in the Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa, and I'm working on trying to develop ideas that I can use for uh, for research later on. Didn't find a huge amount of material on on history and Chat GPT, so this is. This conversation is really interesting. There's a few things that kind of, kind of uh, reached out to me when I was listening to the different speakers. And one thing right away, um, I should preface my remarks by saying I'm also in the process of developing uh, um, a course for uh, second year teacher candidates uh, who are hist will be history teachers. And I'm trying to figure out I have 10 lectures with them. What do I have? What can I do with that short amount of time? Um, Joanna, Johanna mentioned, brought up a word at the beginning of the conversation, which I think is really important. And it's the, um, the whole idea of anxiety around this. Um, I'm trying to imagine the students that I will be having uh, in about two or three weeks. And this will definitely be a, 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 a topic that is brought up. And I think that will come along with the topic is a lot of anxiety because these are young teachers who in a, um, a few months time will be in the could be in a classroom and we'll have to be dealing with um, the complexities of, of, of uh, how information is generated uh, in, in these new forms. The other point that I want, just wanted to bring up was Frederic's point uh, regarding um, uh, how does this relate to any kind of academic research and does it relate? And Frederic was talking about the fact there's a lack of precision, uh, there's no sourcing. If there are any sources, it's Wikipedia. Um, and it's not precise in the language. I love the, what you showed in the uh, presentation of five finger text and I would love it if you could put that Federic on um, our Slack group because there's some really interesting exercises that you um, just 
introduced about students going back in and doing editing work on on a, a text from ChatGPT, and I think that would be an, an, a really good authentic learning experience for students. So I think that's about my time. Those are two reflections I saw on this, and um, really appreciate the conversation so far. Learning a lot. Terrific. Thank you all so much, and thank you all so much too for. Um, doing such brilliant insights in such um, tight, condensed space of time so that we could get such a wide diversity of perspectives and then allow time for conversation. So uh, at this point, Jimena and I will uh, ask a few questions of our panelists um, just to kind of uh, whet the appetite for a broader conversation among all of us. So if you're listening and you have ideas and questions, now's the time to formulate them. Uh, you can put them in the chat or you could wait uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes and then we'll open it up to a broader conversation. And that conversation could be questions or it could just be comments and reactions that you have, things you're seeing in your classroom, things you're seeing in your local history society or local museum, uh, things you're seeing among teachers, uh, questions or that you want to pose to the group. This really is envisioned to be a roundtable and a learning experience for all of us. Um, but let me take moderator prerogative here and pull on one thread that I felt uh, merited a little bit further excavation. Uh, at several times, people brought up the question of precision, the question of accuracy, the question of reliability. This is something that I wrote about in my book as well. This is you know, sort of an aspiration for professional history to get it right, to be precise, to be reliable. In some ways, I would say it's a fundamental value uh, of our work and a value that we bring to the public sphere. But one of the concerns that I had when I wrote and researched my book is that it's increasingly difficult to argue for the role of precision, accuracy, and reliability in an environment that Johanna said privileges the quick, the instant, the good enough, the uh, what scholars have called the satisficing. So if chat GPT or AI tools can give you a good enough answer in so many different places, whether it be in a classroom, in a political setting, in writing a grant, et cetera, uh, why or how do we argue that good enough is not good enough? That precision and accuracy and reliability at the standards that we'd like to see are what people should strive towards. And I say this as someone who recently, uh, again, looked back at the early history of Wikipedia and found similar rhetoric, right? There was this concern among historians that Wikipedia was sort of good enough, not up to scholarly standards, not precise enough, not accurate enough, not reliable enough. And yet Wikipedia went on to become one of the most visited websites in the world, the largest online encyclopedia, and the training source for now GPT and other open AI tools. So uh, while we might strive for precision, accuracy, and reliability, does the very existence and prevalence of chat GPT and other open AI tools make that a harder and harder argument to sell? So I wanna throw that open to our panelists first and see if anybody has any reaction to that or uh, wants to expound on that. Johanna? to unmute. Sure. Um, so that's one of my fears and something I've seen play out just in this last month, which is that, um, you know, one little and like one little example is that we have a local historical society in Orange County called the O&W Railroad Railway Historical Society. They're unfortunately going through a little turmoil because they've lost the building that they have been in for a couple of years and need to move all of their their um, material, which is, you can imagine, rooms and rooms full of file cabinets and boxes with original material, which is not digitized. Um, and it's a bunch of volunteers, you know, maybe a dozen that monitor this collection and, and deal with it. Well, anyway, they asked me for some help in trying to find a new location. I have a you know large mailing list, so I was able to send out a, a, a message asking for help uh, for volunteers to help move items and, and those sorts of, of tasks. Um, and in doing so, I said, let me speed this up a little bit. And I quickly went into chat GPT and I said, please tell me, a par give me a paragraph about the history of the O&W Railroad. That way I can just plug that in. You know, That way I can ask uh, the public, come help the O&W. They're very historically important for these reasons. Um, and so I did so. And what it spit out at me was uh, a beautifully written paragraph, but it had a sentence in it that said, the O&W Railway was the first railroad in the world to use electric locomotives. 
It's just false. It's just simply false. Um, but um, this is an example where it's a good enough situation that goes out in a newsletter in a larger that's not really the point. The po that was just a little paragraph to give a little bit of history to the background. And I can imagine that somebody who isn't like me, who hasn't l looked through those paper records in the past and hasn't you know, been very interested in this topic of railways in Orange County, New York, like um, like you were saying earlier, these niche areas of concern, um, somebody else would have just taken that and used it. And it would have been um, you know, information that comes out from an official voice, maybe a government, maybe a historical society or something like that. And then it gets um, becomes part of this prevailing narrative. And then somebody's writing a paper uh, in a college classroom and they pull that information and they use it. Um, it it's, that's what I fear. I fear these little incremental changes that are going to create inaccuracies um, in the larger picture. And as I said before, I don't think that you can really get through to a lot of elected officials except for to say that this will hurt the bottom line if this ends up in things like grant applications or places where, where money is at stake. Um, so that's. That's kind of my um, my feeling on the matter is that these little incremental inaccuracies are really harmful in the long run, and they really degrade the work of all of us who have um, an interest in accuracy and in primary sources. Nathan. Uh, thank you. So I think one thing I wanted to point out was that um, to your point, Jason, the, the situation is probably more dire than we think it is about the accuracy of chat GPT. Only 3% of the corpus of what it's actually trained on is Wikipedia. About 80 something percent of it is just the internet at large. So I think this really emphasizes that it is not a knowledge model. It's not even trained on sources that anyone believed in the first place knew anything about knowledge. It's only trained on how people talk and how people write. Um, that's really all that it knows and all that it's aware of. Um, another, point, another point that I wanted to bring up was that we're still very early in the days of chat GPT and what it's going to be doing. Um, something a lot of people don't realize is that chat GPT was considered a failed product by OpenAI before it was released to the public. They trained it for several domain specific causes in healthcare and customer service for a variety of applications. And they found that it didn't work good enough to convince anyone or complete any of the tasks that they wanted. And them opening up to the public was essentially them throwing in the towel and saying, we don't know what to do with this. Can somebody find a way that we can make money off of this thing that we've invested this, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of man hours into? So even OpenAI itself, when they talk about it, they don't present it as a knowledge model. They don't even present any use case for it yet because they don't know what the public is going to be using it for. And I think that's important because that means there's still time to shape that narrative of how will OpenAI choose to market this product? How will they choose to talk about it? And how will they choose to disclose what they think it's capable of and what they think it isn't capable of and what kinds of use cases would be appropriate? Terrific. And Andreas, we will get to you in a few seconds. We're just going to get a couple more insights from the panel. So please stay patient. Appreciate you raising your hand. Um, and I see that there's comments in the chat as well. And yes, one thing it's important to remember, uh, Silicon Valley tech, it works off of hype. So uh, one of the main ways that these products take off is you release them, you generate hype, it gets in the press, people like us talk about it. That attracts funders, funders put in more money, that allows more development. Uh, the other thing we should all remember, too, is that what's released to the public is just a small fraction of what's actually being worked on, right? So there's already many iterations of this to come. If we're seeing it, it's already old news in Silicon Valley. So there's other stuff behind the scenes that is being worked on that uh, could be even more powerful and more robust. And so that's also something for us to keep in mind. One of the reasons why the HCI wants to be in conversation with tech companies so that we can be at the table as products are being developed. Uh, Frederic, and then Jimena, uh, I'll ask you to weigh in if you have a question as well. So Frederic first. Concerning the, the good enough thing, I'm more concerned about um, inequality of access to, uh, to, uh, to knowledge. In a way, um, um, it's like when the industry was born at one point, people handcrafting things really became something really important, but for the richest people. And in a way, we might be as historians re be become again important uh, because we handcraft our knowledge. 
in a way. Uh, and but but that will have a cost, and this cost will probably leave pave the way for inequalities, new inequalities in the access to for the access of knowledge. That that's more my um, concern today. Yeah, I agree with that. There's technology creates so many inequalities, and these tech companies have created. Uh, immeasurable inequalities in the way they've operated. Um, Jimena, over to you. Yes, thank you, Jason. Um, thank you for your interventions. Uh, I'm going to talk about my own experience. I work in a very small liberal art college in New York. We have a very small history department. There's five of us only. So it's we know the students well enough, and suddenly we have been noticing that students are writing beautifully, like they're writing perfect, uh, but they don't know what they're writing but we cannot prove it's plagiarism because it's not. So some of my colleagues are just saying, we have to be tougher and grade them more harder. And I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking perhaps not, perhaps we have to find a way to integrate those kinds of tools in teaching history. So that's something that has come up in my own, like my own um, exercise of teaching history, knowing that Students only are do because they're not interested in history. We just provide like the service of history, but we have very few majors in history. So that also makes me think, um, how can we use these tools to engage people in actually not thinking that history is just writing beautifully, that, but doing some kind of research uh, uh, research and using the sources so that I would also would like to know your take on that, like using those kinds of tools for actually making it work for teaching. That's great. Um, Sadia? Actually, um, that's a really good point. I think to that point, I've recently been following a few um, teachers on um, TikTok who are posting about using ChatGPT as a teaching tool to really talk to their students about um, grammatical constructions, about um, what it takes to write uh, of sort of an essay in the in the best formatted way how to argue their points and what they have actually asked their students to do is say here's the here's the question that i'm going to ask you to research writing an essay about using chat gpt so not the content itself but the format and then i want you to redline it and explain what it got right and what it got wrong in terms of how it structured the response then i want you to go and research the accuracy um, and find out how much of what it actually produced as content and as re results is um, correct or incorrect. So, I think it's I think it's exciting to kind of use it as a tool for teaching in that way. Um, but I think some of what you know, sort of Nathan has pointed out and, Fr and Frederic has pointed out as well, is that we can't really use it for the content. We can really only use it for the structure of the language, and it's also limited to the English language. Great. So um, let's open it up for a broader conversation, just uh, to restate a few ground rules. Um, you can ask a question, you can make a comment, you can share your expertise, you can share your concerns or anxieties. Just do keep it brief uh, because we want to make sure we have a lot of time to get people in and we want to make sure we also have time to answer those questions uh, as they come up. There are also some questions and comments in the chat that people have put in. So we'll try to get to those as well. Uh, I'll ask Gunnar to maybe pick out a, one or two of those that are really good, or if there's a common theme or a thread that we can pull on for our conversation, we can do that. I'll also just quickly remind you that um, you know this History Communication Institute that we're building, this community of people that are on this call, uh, none of us had done an event together before this. We all just got together very recently. Uh, through the Slack channel, sharing ideas, sharing concerns, sharing knowledge. And we pulled this together, and this is just the beginning. So by being here, you're now also part of that community. And I would love, we would love for you to deepen your engagement with that community by joining our Slack. Uh, Gunnar will put the link in again for people who want to join. Uh, contribute your expertise, be part of the conversation, share links, share research, share what you're finding in the field. Uh, because it's by working together and bringing all areas of the field together that we'll be able to tackle these questions and wrestle with them more productively. So uh, thank you for being here as part of this community, and I'm looking forward to you staying part of the community moving forward. Uh, Andreas had his hand up before and has waited very patiently. Thank you so much, Andreas. Would love to bring you into the conversation for a question or a comment. 
Yes. Thank you. Just unlike me being patient, uh, but uh, here I am. Thanks for having me here in this round. Uh, I'm a professor of history education at Hamburg University in Germany. And I've been using uh, ChatGPT not very often, and not very much, but I've tried it out in German. So we had a question earlier, I think, by Lorella, how does it work in different languages and in other languages? And it is quite smooth. It is really working uh, kind of perfect. And I think the experiences are quite the same. It gives an illusion of authority. It gives an illusion even of analysis. But what I think is, is even worse or, or even more crucial, it also gives an illusion of being reflective. If you, if you ask it, it says, I don't know for sure, I'm only interpreting and you have to be careful about. So it gives an illusion of not being as authoritative as people will take it and as students do take it. So there is a, is a tension between this, I have the information and I give it to you and being reflective, which may be, may be um, uh, very crucial. And I think that's something which, which uh, has uh, influence on what maybe our, but mostly our, also our students and the public's idea of history is about. I think we need to move on uh, for the for the public um, uh, nature of history approach um, from stressing that it's about correct statements about the past uh, onto that we recognize that it's all about uh, interpretations which have a perspective, which have a question in the back. And that is something which ChatGPT seems to deliver. It seems to deliver analysis, but it doesn't. So within a very, very well phrased analysis, there are points hidden which are problematic. And to, and to find these takes more than just fact checking. What I'm concerned with is, you may, you may all know Sam Weinberg's work about lateral reading and fact checking and uh, uh, it, something like that I think we need, but it won't be enough. It's not about finding out whether what ChatGPT uh, releases is reliable or um, uh, fake news or something like that, but in what way? What is the logic? What is the interpretive structure behind it, which uh, students and the public uh, and even historians, we all need, uh, need to learn to assess. And I think that's a, some total new uh, task. In a way, it's not source criticism, but uh, um, uh, uh, interpretation criticism uh, as to technology. I yeah. think we need to work on that. Thanks. I agree. I, I think we're entering a whole new era of information and media literacy. It's not just about what you see on social media, but it's understanding how AI platforms generate answers, where those answers are coming from, and having the information literacy and the fluency to determine and suss it out. And that might be something where historians can make important interventions. Uh, in curriculum and in public society. Uh, we have a hand from Apollonia. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that somewhat correctly. Uh, so welcome, and uh, please do introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and uh, would love to have your contribution. Hey, hi, I'm Apollonia Kutz. Yes, you're pronouncing it perfectly. Um, thank you uh, all for organizing it. It's actually very interesting for me especially uh, as I started using it in history. I am a PhD student uh, in Jewish studies. I specialize in migration from Eastern Europe to Great Britain uh, in Edwardian period. And um, so I will start with the, um, the comment about um, using it in different languages. So I've had an experience of using it in English and an experience of using it in Polish. Uh, and Polish um, actually is quite good as well. Um, I mean, there are some uh, language uh, issues, uh, especially when you start writing more specific and using some difficult uh, um, words, he, he's losing the, the understanding of them. Like let's say British dominium, I write it in Polish, and then he's um, mixing dominium with domination. Uh, which is quite similar word in Polish, but then uh, he's rephrasing it in a way that it really loses the the original meaning. Meaning, but however, with the with the check of uh, of the human, you can actually rephrase it quite well. Um, and in general, my comment and my use of it, uh, I'm actually very much uh, interested in how it will uh, evolve. 
I actually see a, a very big uh, use of it, uh, especially for, for myself. I have a very severe dyslexia and for me, it is extremely hard to write a text and to um, put things that are in my head onto a paper. So when I put uh, my notes uh, on um, that I made after reading a, um, a mature source material to the chat GP and say, or oh, rephrase it into paragraphs, write sentence from my you know, notes, he is making some sort of a structure of the text that I can edit later. And that allowed me very quickly to progress uh, and not fight through my disability. And uh, if I am trying to write as quickly as possible. I, for the past two weeks, I actually started um, writing more my PhD than I did before because it allowed me to progress with the blocks of text that I can edit because I, I gained the possibility to edit and that gives me um, the possibility to write it more quickly. I am not using it at all uh, for knowledge because, well, it fantasizes about my topic very well, but it doesn't have any truth. Uh, I discovered that one of my, uh, the editors of the newspaper that I'm writing about is connected somehow with um, Rothschild family and he was in winemaking and book, book sellings, you know, very good stories you could write about it, but there was nothing true about it. Um, but other than that, um, the, the, the some sort of um, structure and using it in a, in a, um, as a correction, uh, I think it's, it's brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's a great, thank you for sharing that. Um, let me circle back um, a little bit then about this question about inequality, which came up before. Um, certainly tech has the ability to create inequalities, but it could also have the ability to shrink gaps uh, and allow people uh, to do things uh, easier, better, faster than maybe they otherwise could. Uh, is, that, is that something that maybe in the classroom, uh, in public history settings, uh, we could leverage this tool uh, to help people? Um, any thoughts on that, Frederic, uh, Jimena, Johanna, before I open it back up again to questions? Uh, yes, I would like to comment that uh, also, Apollonia, thank you very much for sharing that. Also talking about my own experience, I have, I teach a lot of students with disabilities. And also that, uh, I mean, sheds light on my own experience and ways that I could think about in helping them write. Most of my students are very afraid of writing. And suddenly when they write very well, you know, something's going on, you know, there's not their own production. So perhaps your, your insight, I mean, your insight was very helpful for me to seeing things in another way and perhaps thinking ways to help students. So thank you for that. Amazing. And please do join the Slack uh, because we'd love to have more of your insights. Uh, let me take a question from the chat really quick. And then I see Sebastian has his hand up as well. But I want to get to a question that Brian asked, Brian Martin. Um, and if Brian wants to come off mute, he can, or I can just kind of get the question uh, from the chat. But uh, he asked about, you know, what historians can be doing behind the scenes or maybe out in front of the scenes uh, to work with technologists, to work with tech companies, to, to be part of the advocacy conversation around this so that as these tools get developed, uh, the values that we want to see in the world, accuracy, reliability, information literacy, uh, get reflected. Uh, that's a question that is near and dear to my heart because that's really why we started the HCI in the first place. And the HCI has built some partnerships with tech. We're a partner with All Tech is Human. We're a partner with the Unfinished Network. We're a partner with Sitara, who I consider to be a tech company. Um, and uh, but I want let's think aloud a little bit uh, uh, around this question. And I'd invite anyone in the chat to join in, Fernanda or others who are working in this area. Area, um, is there some sort of an advocacy uh, component to this? Is there some sort of history communication project around? Um, building our values into these tech tools moving forward to help uh, shape them and mold them in the directions that we want to see. Um, and I don't have anybody in particular that I want to put on the spot, but uh, I'm going to put Steve on the spot first because I feel like he would have a really good answer to this. <laughs> Boy, you got me checking different screens. So ask the question again, please. <laughs> Advocacy, how do historians advocate for the values we want to see as these tools are developed? 
So let me answer that in a different way. It gets back to your good enough and the sufficiency point that you made, which I think is, is very valid. Um, I think one of the problems is, you know, we've, we're talking about a tool that was developed to deal with language and to respond to uh, requests for information based on language and the way it's out there on the internet, rather than knowledge. Um, and what it kind of reflects to me is that I'm a little bit concerned on how little history is available on the internet in some ways for, for people to mine. So you've got Wikipedia, which we all know has both good and bad um, aspects. But I wonder whether or not we can broaden the way we think about this problem and say, how can we do a better job of getting um, historical information out available for these people to use when they come up with the tools? Um, and, and I know that's a harder question. That's a bigger issue. Um, but I, I think it would be worthwhile for everyone as they develop tools in the future to have a, a more robust, wider group of stuff rather than just Reddits or, or Wikipedia. So I, I know I kind of dodged the question. But. No, I think that's a very legitimate answer. It gets a little bit to the question of open access, which the American Historical Association came out against uh, very soundly in one of its public statements a few years ago. Uh, and there's also this question about journal models and, and information in JSTOR that is inaccessible to many of these language models, and so it doesn't get incorporated. Um, so I think those are all very relevant. Um, again, this is a roundtable, so we're getting lots of different threads pulled in. But let me get Fernanda and Brian, and then we'll get back to Sebastian. Sebastian, I did not forget you. Uh, but Fernanda? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in on the point and the question you asked, Jason, about, you know, what are what are ways to advocate for using this building on some of the things that people have already mentioned? I think the most exciting thing that I see in it is the ability to uh, use it for reducing barriers, right? Whether it's in language creation, as with you shared about in your example, or whether it's taking really complicated texts and making them accessible to young kids. We did this experiment in a workshop at the Smithsonian last week, where we took incredibly complicated descriptions of art pieces, completely inaccessible. They're on the walls in museums, put them through chat GPT and said, turn this into something a fifth grader could read. It was brilliant was absolutely perfect. No edits needed, right? I mean, it wasn't, you know, gorgeous English, but that a fifth grader could open it up and be like, oh my God, that's so cool. Like turning something from inaccessible to, oh my God, that's so cool in the matter of three seconds is revolutionary, right? Particularly for some of these historical institutions. So how do we um, see that as the exciting thing? Not again, for generating knowledge, but for reducing barriers to access to, to to the kind of things that are written. I mean, it's also would be interesting. I, I don't know how you feel, but a lot of history writing, I, 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 my professor was Paul Kennedy and he was often my PhD advisor and he was often criticized for writing in a way that was too accessible, right? He was writing for the public and not for academia. It was way too well-written. Like, why would you write a bestseller if you could write, write something that only a few people can read? I mean, we as historians often have these have an, have an approach to writing that makes it completely inaccessible to a regular human being. The ability of something like ChatGPT to take excellent historical research that is often written by people that do not write for the public to help turn it into something that is accessible to a broader audience, that I find is really exciting because um, it allows people to um, engage with some of the juiciness of historical research without having to go into the brain of someone who is often not trained to write for the general public. And we're not going to train the entire historical profession to writing like a human being anytime soon, right? It just isn't. It's not how we're trained as, as PhDs. It's not the point. Um, but it's, I think that's, that's a fun thing to, to experiment with. Um, and see what um, how we can explore, and I'd be excited to see whether there's more work um, that we can do, you know, as a as a as a field, as a as a group like this, um, to experiment with it and see what comes out. Well, you know, I'm always in, so that's great. Um, let's get Brian, and then I'm going to get Sebastian back up, and then Nathan will get you as well. So don't go anywhere, uh, Brian. Yes, I just wanted to add to the point of, you know, how do we collaborate with the tech world on this? And as Jason pointed out, you know, the, the bulk of this, you know, ChatGPT is this failed product that's now out here in the open and everybody's playing with it. 
but there's these huge investments that big tech has made in similar kinds of products that are still in development. And what I've been reading in general is one of the reasons we're not seeing them is they're a little bit concerned about the risks of putting stuff like this out there because they're seeing the inaccuracies and the reliability issues and other kinds of things. So they may actually be at a point in their risk management calculations to, to, to listen to people who have some of these concerns. If we can articulate them in ways that address their risk management concerns rather than just our gripes. Uh, we just need to think about how do we phrase these things because they are very legitimate concerns and they're much broader than our small community. But we care about this stuff more than most people. And we've thought about it more than most people. So perhaps there's ways we can articulate these concerns and get in front of the, the right people to, to influence product development. Absolutely. Uh, Sebastian, thank you, Brian. Sebastian, uh, thank you for being patient. Um, no problem. Thank you so much for this talk. Absolutely fascinating. So I'm a Bates, uh, I'm a student at Bates College on, on, in, in uh, doing an undergrad. And I was kind of wondering, kind of in line with what Brian was talking about, like, what is the scale of disruption that we're talking about? And um, is there like, to what extent is uh, the risk of being fully overwhelmed by uh, these new technologies, because I can say on the, just on a practical level, not many students talk about it for how disruptive this seems to be. And institutions seem to be slow at like creating clear policies of how they're going to integrate it uh, within like as, as, a, as a toolkit, because it's there, we can't take it away. So what 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 is this degree of disruption that we're talking about? Great question. I think Nathan's the perfect person to answer that with. Uh, so he had his hand up earlier. So. <laughs> Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I think that's an open question, to be completely honest. I think that with almost all these technological tools, there's obviously, I think we've been talking about a lot of potential for kind of evening the playing field and increasing efficiency and kind of, you know, having positive improvements and positive impacts on, you know, the way that we live and work. But there's also enormous potential for them to be disruptive and cause a lot of damage. I think, um, you know, to speak quite frankly, like at least here in the United States, we haven't had a great track record of the government trying to kind of create policy to put guardrails on how these things are adopted and trying to, you know, think about what are the things that could go wrong and how do we proactively prevent them. Um, and this kind of ties back into the greater point about advocacy that we were talking about. Um, I do think that you know, it's important to engage with tech companies directly um, because they're the ones creating the tools. But in some sense, I feel like even more importantly, it's important to engage with investors like Brian said, and really be talking about what are the social costs of these tools? Like in the environment, you know, in, in um, an environmental and a sustainability context, there's these conversations about what are the carbon costs? What are the, you know, full life cycle? What are the hidden costs that we don't know about products? And those are increasingly helping investors make smarter and more educated decisions about you know how they want to create things create physical objects and i think that it might be really helpful to be having a frame to have a framework to think about what's the social cost both in disruption and in displaced labor and in um kind of you know labor conflict that's going to be caused by the adoption of these new technologies and how do we adopt that into the way that we think about what's the profitability of these tools I'd like to just jump in quickly and add to that. Um, I feel like this is not a beginning point of, you know, how are we going to deal with this big change? I think this is a longer picture of 20 or more years where there's been this uh, movement towards speeding up the process of the output and but not allowing the resources that are needed to do the, the fundamental work. And it's separating the work of history, at least on the public history level, from the physical, from the sites themselves, from the museum collections, from the documents. And I feel like that's the problem is that is that Wikipedia and all these other mechanisms that we have to speed up the process of sharing information publicly is um, it, it's uneven because there's no investment being done on on the real stuff. Um, and and I feel like this could be a great tool. This could be wonderful if JSTOR you know, had an agreement um, with with chat uh, GPT or if our local governments invested in 
large scale strategies for digitizing records in public, putting them in public places that are accessible, uh, working together regionally or, or, or even broader. So I think that this is just a further disconnect and, and we're, you know, we're progressing along this line of, of devaluing the, the, the physical, the actual documents and places. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'll do a shameless plug for my book, which talks about that 20 year evolution, starting with Wikipedia and ending AI, which I do see this not as a new thing, but the continuance of this disruption of the historical process and the creation of knowledge. Um, I do want to get a question from the chat. Uh, Kim Fortney from National History Day has a question which I think is very important and relevant. And probably a few of our experts on the panel here can weigh in. But she has a question about detection. Could anyone on the panel speak to the detection tools of AI generated that are being developed? Uh, this is becoming a big deal in the National History Day community. What can we tell judges about ways to tell if a student is pulling text from AI? Um, so a very practical application of some of these questions uh, to a particular circumstance, but one that affects students across the country. Thousands of students participate in National History Day uh, here in the United States. Um, does anyone have any insight into that or any tools that we could point people towards? And again, I'm just going to remind you, please do join our Slack, because if there's things that we come up with later, uh, links, tools, resources, we're going to put them in the Slack. So if you're in the Slack, you'll see all the resources and tools uh, that we pull together. Um, I'll let our panel marinate on that. And in the meantime, I'll allow Ed to uh, Edward Knobloch to offer a, a comment. Oh, Edward, you're muted. Yeah, uh, this is uh, addressing uh, what Johanna had to say at the very beginning, um, which is, um, uh, are there any historical analogies that we can look to? Um, and in my more despairing moments, uh, I think of the end of the classical era. Uh, and that's incorporated in uh, the, the, the glib saying that less and less is getting more and more available. Um, so when we look at the classical era, uh, we see all sorts of references to uh, 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 Greek plays that there are only one or two lines that still exist. Uh, uh, and example would be in Roman law, okay? All we really have of Roman law is the digest that was done uh, under Justinian. Um, so the, uh, the 12 tablets, the foundations of Roman law, we only know what a few of those lines were because they were quoted in archaic Latin in the digest. Um, uh, and I think that's what's happening with uh, things like uh, chat uh, 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 GPT, um, Wikipedia, uh, and uh, the electronic sources uh, in general. Uh, uh, it's not just JSTOR articles that are inaccessible, but it's uh, as uh, our local historians uh, 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 have been saying, there's just so much more that exists, okay, that's not going to be made available on the internet. Uh, there simply is not the time or, or money to do that. Yes, I used to work at the Library of Congress, which has 175 million items in counting. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that all 175 million items will never be uh, available digitally. Um, and uh, I don't want, to, I, I, I'm sorry to, to cut it short, Edward. Uh, I, I, I would encourage you to continue to put your comments in the chat, but I do want to be cognizant of time because we promised that we would end at 1.30 and we promised that we would leave five minutes um, for uh, conclusions and next steps. So I do apologize, Edward, but please do put any other additional comments in the chat. And also please do join our Slack channel to share your expertise. Uh, the historical analogies are definitely important and we'd love to think about them and include them in our thinking moving forward. Um, but spinning this forward then, uh, I wanna throw it open to the panel and to everyone else on the call. The HCI is committed 
to tackling these issues, and we're committed to tackling them in partnership with other organizations. We've partnered with All Tech is Human, which is a uh, nonprofit based out of New York that is thinking about ethical and responsible tech and the design choices that go into these platforms. We are a partner with the uh, Unfinished Network, which is interested in how tech is affecting or disrupting democracy and democratic processes. Uh, we are partnering with Corvus in, the, in Belgium. We're in partnering with IFPH Explorers through events like this. Uh, we are kindred spirits with the History Collab and Fernanda's group, um, and we're willing uh, to uh, we're willing to partner with anyone and anyone on next steps. So, what are those next steps? Should there be an advocacy campaign? Should there be a report, uh, a white paper that we create that gets forwarded to policymakers? Should there be uh, some sort of coalition uh, that forms together around information literacy and media literacy uh, when it comes to ChatGPT? Uh, should we create teaching resources for people to integrate into the classroom? Um, this is uh, all up for debate and discussion, but would love to spend these last four minutes getting input from all of you and then following up individually in the Slack. And I'll open it to the panelists first, but uh, to the wider audience as well for, for commentary. Where should we go next? Uh, can I go ahead and give a? Oh give yeah, a please. Yeah. Um, I kind of already summarized some of my thoughts in the in the chat, but I think a um, a major place that I think that especially this group can kind of have some some influence is in how these models are trained, because there's due to just the the volume of data that these need, which is usually in you know the image models are trained on tens of billions of images. ChatGPT is trained on over half a trillion words. Um, it's, it's just such an immense amount of data that up to this point, it's been trained on just crawling the internet and just grabbing everything it can from the internet. And they don't even bother filtering it because that costs too much money and too much time. Um, so there's not a lot of thought put into it. And that's why we end up with a lot of these biases that we're talking about, about language bias, about cultural bias. It has biases of only really knowing about popular cultural narratives and you know common facts that everybody knows. Um, and I think that there's a place for experts who can kind of critically look at sources and evaluate them to kind of help with some of that, figuring out how we can create better data sets that aren't just crawls of everything anyone's ever written, but rather are curated and filtered and verified in some sense of being things that we think are, um, are you know, representative of what we would want a model to know about and be able to um, be a source for the general public. I think that's a that's a huge starting point that I think this group and the community might be uniquely positioned to kind of contribute to. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I wanted to get LK into the conversation if she's still willing. I saw she raised her hand. Uh, oh, there she is. Hey everyone. Hey, I'm LK. This has been the most amazing conversation. I've had colleagues pass my office and they're like, "What's going on in here?" It's I can't thank you enough for putting this together, Jason, and for all of the speakers today. I got so much out of this. Um, one thing I will say, kind of building on Nathan's comments and some of the earlier comments is that people are actually interested in talking to us um, and hearing about um, things that historians in particular have to say, because a lot of these tech developers, a lot of people that are thinking about the fourth industrial revolution, they talk about history, they think about history all the time. It's just that they don't really have access to great historical data and great frameworks and, and people to chat with. So I think it's good for us to, you know, just to keep working on our digital literacy together. That's why these kinds of like more diverse conversations are so helpful. So we know what kinds of questions to ask and where the opportunities are. And then we also see these calls from companies and from organizations like OpenAI did have, you know, back in 2017 for humanities scholars to weigh in on ethical concerns, making sure that there's a very robust representation of people that have a basic understanding of the tech and are ready to talk about these larger questions. And for those of you who don't know LK, she is brilliant and amazing and also part of our HCI community, which is another reason why you should join the Slack. Um, let's get Lorella and Jimena to close us out. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, something about uh, perhaps the following, the next steps uh, after this amazing roundtable that you um, put together uh, with uh, Johanna. Thank you so much. Um, I was thinking that um, there is an increasingly uh, an increasing digital component to libraries now. Perhaps we should advocate more collaborations uh, between um, OpenAI and the digital libraries to access digital sources that are scholarly work um, and that are op open access perhaps um, to, in fact, increase sources authenticity and reliability and in a way counterbalance these um, popular culture, disinformation, fake news, opinions, comments, um, that of course hinders our comprehension of how reliable are their answers uh, that we get from open AI tools. I just wanted to say that. Yes, brilliant. I love it. And Jimena, you get the last word. Oh, thank you. And just just thinking of steps forward, perhaps we could, I also put, I put this in the chat, but I'm gonna say it here. Perhaps we can also socialize like examples, like the one Fernanda mentioned that, that worked well, and also to explain like more to people, what's this about? Because we know, but many people still don't know, don't have a, a I mean, don't have a, like a right idea of how this works. So maybe like doing more socialization and I'm thinking about the explorers, precisely of the International Federation for Public History. We are a space that devoted to that, to promoting information, to making uh, bridges uh, among public historians, but not only public historians, we have had public archeologists, artists, activists, etc. cetera. So uh, um, if you want to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, but we are also an open space for you. If you want to come to me, we can make an event uh, and promote your research. So thank you very much. And thank you for partnering with us and making this event possible. Thank you to all of the speakers who volunteered their time to be here today to share these insights. Uh, I hope it was as stimulating for all of you as it was for me, a reminder that this event came together through a group of people that had never met in person. Well, I would met Steve in person, but Nathan in person, but uh, largely came together through our Slack community online where we shared ideas, we shared resources, we shared questions and concerns, and we determined to get together and collaborate and, and start a conversation. So please do join us in the Slack to continue the conversation, to continue communing with these amazing, brilliant people, and to continue to advance the causes and the values that we want to see in the world. Uh, this event was recorded. Uh, we will try to get the video up as soon as possible. Um, and we'll also try to get the, uh, the links that were shared and the insights that were shared in the chat to people, uh, either in the Slack group or on social media as possible. Uh, but in the meantime, please do stay in touch, follow us on Twitter, stay connected, and uh, much more on this all to come. Thank you to everybody, and have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you, everyone, and a great appreciation to Orange County government for providing this forum today on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. I hope this is the beginning of a longer conversation. Have a good day.